interest in Disney goes beyond just the basics. I don't want to learn about just the movies or just the parks. I want to learn about the greater canon. You give me a piece of obscure history, and I will want to learn everything I can about it. This is why I have this character deep dive series. To learn about the Disney characters that we might not always think about. And folks, have we got a nice big piece of obscurity for you. We'll be talking about Disney's first print star, Bucky Bug. Don't know who he is? Well, that's why we're here today. We'll be digging deep into the annals of Disney history to find out, once and for all, who the hell is Bucky? So find a nice little crag in the wall to snuggle into, and relax as we learn about this little critter together. The early 30s were an exciting time at the Disney Studios. Mickey Mouse was at the height of his popularity, becoming more famous than most movie stars. And it was more than just cartoons. He appeared in toys, books, watches, and, yes, comics. Mickey Mouse comics were syndicated in newspapers across America, debuting in 1930. They were similarly successful, and lasted for many decades. But it wasn't just him. The Silly Symphony cartoons were similarly big hits, with tons of popular cartoons. If you remember my video of the skeleton dance, they were built around one-off characters where the animation was dictated by the music, instead of the other way around. Soon, they were receiving a lot of merchandising attention. And sure enough, they began to appear in full-color comics in American newspapers. Every Sunday, newspapers would get an entire page of Disney comics, both the Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphony strips. It was a recipe for success. One problem. The Silly Symphonies were all one-offs. There weren't any characters that could be followed in a weekly serial. The series would eventually produce popular characters, but that hadn't happened yet. In order for the series to work, they needed a central character that audiences could gravitate towards. They needed their own Mickey Mouse. It was Earl Duvall who came up with the solution. You see, some of the early Silly Symphony cartoons featured dancing bugs. And cutesy bugs were popular subjects for cartoonists in the 20s and 30s. So, why not make a bug character? He would make his debut to the public on January 10th, 1932. The bug was one of 17 children to two bug parents. He had 16 sisters, and he was the only son. He didn't have a name at first. They made it a contest where readers sent in letters with suggestions. It was Berenice from Minneapolis who gave the bug his name, officially christening him Bucky on March 20th, 1932. She was given a Mickey Mouse plushie as a gift, and other contestants got prizes as well. The likelihood of anyone who entered this contest watching this video is... slim. But on the off chance that you are, let me know how it went down in the comments. The structure of a Bucky Bug comic is pretty simple. Bucky gets into trouble, Wiggle gets out of it, and we close on an open ending that can be resolved in next week's comic. On average, there were 6 to 10 panels a week in a classic rubber hose drawing style, and the entire story is told in rhyme, from the narration to the character's dialogue. As a character, Bucky is quick-witted and adventurous. When he's only a few weeks old, he leaves home to go out on an adventure. He's quick to make friends and is sometimes a little naive because of it. Really, he isn't dissimilar to Mickey in his early years. If you wanted to turn a Bucky Buck story into a Mickey Mouse story, you wouldn't have to change much. The gags are what set them apart. A lot of the jokes and stories centered on the bugs being small. You know how in something like A Bug's Life, the settings are just scaled up versions of everyday items? Like when Flick gets to the big city, the buildings are all just used boxes and garbage? It's the same kind of thing here. One of his buddies builds a house out of an old hat. And he lives in a town called Junkville, so all of the houses are like that. But Bucky didn't have his stories alone. He had a couple of supporting players helping him out. In one of his first major arcs, he met Bo, a tramp who traveled from place to place. He's Bucky's mentor and helps him get set up in Junkville. They just try to get by, helping each other out with what they need. Eventually, he leaves Junkville and gets a big send-off strip in honor of it. You could definitely draw some connections to the era with Bo being a hobo. This was made during the Depression, after all. And Rubberhose protagonists wouldn't be complete without a love interest to go with them. 
Junebug is Bucky's girlfriend, the daughter of the mayor of Junkville. Several arcs in the story are centered on Bucky going through trials to gain her father's blessings. Getting a job, being the town general, winning a duel, the works. Eventually, he gains his approval, and he and June get married. Congrats, you did the one thing that Mickey and Minnie have never gotten to do. The initial Bucky Bug run can be split up into six arcs. The first arc centers on Bucky trying to find his name, which included the aforementioned contest. The second arc has Bucky moving into Junkville and meeting Bo and June. The third arc involves Bucky becoming a general and fighting off a neighborhood kingdom of flies. It's probably the most action-packed arc of this run. The fourth has Bucky returning home and helping his parents move into a new house. No word on the rest of his sisters, I guess they went on their own adventures. The fifth arc is just weird. Out of nowhere, this slice of lifey comic turns into Alice in Wonderland as Bucky travels through Mother Gooseland. Like two strips ago, we were learning about inner beauty through butterflies and trying to escape predators. Now, suddenly there's Humpty Dumpty. He just goes around and meets various nursery rhyme characters. The Crooked Man, Mary Quite Contrary, Little Boy Blue, and pretty much any other nursery rhyme you can think of. It does align with some of the other Silly Symphony cartoons, but those were still years away. And when the arc's over, the nursery rhymes are never mentioned again. It's just a weird little detour. Anyways, the next arc is business as usual. Bucky returns to Junkville to marry June, but he's been gone for so long that she's gonna marry someone else. Which... The gap was only nine real world months, and assuming Mother Gooseland works by Narnia rules, it might have been even shorter. I'd have given him at least a year, Mr. Bug. So they're about to have a happy reunion, but June's fiance challenges him to a duel, and quickly chickens out so they get married anyway. They have a happy honeymoon, move into their own place, and thus, the first Bucky Bug story comes to an end. The Silly Symphony comics persisted for another decade, but Bucky wouldn't be in any of them. Why did they give him such a finalized ending, without bringing him back for as much as an epilogue? Well, think back to the cartoon series. The Silly Symphonies never really lingered on stories. Each cartoon was one and done. We never got a sequel to The Skeleton Dance or The Goddess of Spring. The same principles might apply to the comics. Plus, Bucky's run lasted for a good two years, and there were other stories to tell. So, when the opportunity showed itself, they chose to end his story on a happy note and moved on to the next. Bucky was brought back for another round of stories in the 40s, now printed in the Walt Disney's Comic and Stories publication. New Bucky Buck stories were published on a semi-regular basis from 1943 through 1955. It wasn't a regular title in the comics, but it popped up in multiple issues a year. The structure followed the usual format. Bucky gets into trouble and finds a clever way to get out of the situation. There are so many different stories that it would be impossible to catalog them all in a YouTube video. Some highlights include Bo's return, a fight with pirates, and a search for a serpent queen. Bucky also traveled with his brother-in-law, Junior. A frequent supporting character from this era is Boodle Beetle, who appeared in many Donald Duck cartoons as an antagonist. Bucky also appeared as a supporting character in a Chip and Dale story. So, he does have a connection to the greater Disney universe. A new set of stories were published in the late 80s, and they continue to this day. Bucky's not as big of a star as Donald or Mickey, but he still gets a fair amount of new content. The Netherlands seems to be where he's the most popular. That's where a majority of these new stories have been published. He's gotten a more rounded design, and he's lost his wings, but he's still recognizably Bucky. Sadly, a majority of them haven't been published in English, but hopefully one day they'll be localized, and we'll get to enjoy these new stories for ourselves. And to any of my Dutch viewers, I would love to know why he's so popular over there. The comment section is all yours. In 2007, Walt Disney Comics and Stories number 677 celebrated Bucky's 75th anniversary. The issue included a new story with the Fly King over 75 years after that first arc. And in 2016, all of the original Bucky strips were published together by IDW Comics for the first time ever. So even if he's not a mainstay star in the US anymore, 
there's still affection for the guy, even after all these years. You may have noticed that I've mainly talked about print appearances in this video. That's atypical of what I've done with these character deep dives. I usually stick with film appearances. Well, it's because Bucky just hasn't had much of a movie career. Let's rewind back to 1932, when the original comic strips were printed. That same year, Bucky appeared in the Silly Symphony cartoon, Bugs in Love. He made his print debut a few months prior, but they were being developed at the same time. In this short, Bucky and June are having a good time in Junkville, until a crow swoops in and attacks them. Now Bucky must fight him off and save his girlfriend. This was the last Silly Symphony cartoon produced in black and white. Fun fact, the crow actually appeared briefly in the initial comic run, as kind of a landlord to the Bug family. His name's Squire Cocker. If you're familiar with the Bucky comics, there are a couple of gags in this cartoon that will be familiar to you. Bucky trying to get out of a cork bottle, Junkville being made out of trash, the leads having to chase off predators trying to eat them, Bugs using caterpillars as horses. It's not one-to-one -one with the comics, there are clear differences. It works as kind of an alternate universe. But strangely, despite his prominence in print, this was the only Bucky Bug cartoon ever produced. They never made another one. Why? Maybe it was because Bucky didn't really do anything that they couldn't get from another character? Like, was there anything about his character that you couldn't just get from Mickey? No, probably not. Plus, Bugs in Love isn't that remarkable of a short. Think to other Silly Symphony cartoons that spawned popular characters. There was something about them that made them stand out. Three Little Pigs was just so good and the characters were so immediately recognizable that it's no surprise that they kept popping up. Donald stood out enough in The Wise Little Hen that making him a prominent character is a no-brainer. There's just nothing punchy or hooky in Bugs in Love. It's just another Disney short. Bucky's only other animated appearance came in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, in a blink and you'll miss it cameo. It's in the scene where Eddie's leaving the studios and tries to catch the red car. If you look in the background, you'll find him sauntering about. Look for Br'er Bear and Coco the Clown, he's near them. I couldn't find him in any of the big tune scenes, but he might be there too. After that, he was never seen again. In the animated realm, but we've already covered the rest. Bucky Bug is an interesting case study. He's had such a huge presence in one area of Disney, but it never really bled into the general Disney canon. Who knows if there's a place for Bucky in the mainstream Disney realm? Maybe one day someone will find one for him. Until then, we can still enjoy these stories and the tiny piece of Disney history that they hold. Because even the smallest players deserve a little bit of time in the limelight. That concludes the video. Now I'll pass the question off to you. What do you think of Bucky? Is there anything you'd like to see be done with him in the future? What character do you want to see covered next? Whatever you're thinking, let me know down in the comments. If you'd like to support the show, please consider hitting up my Patreon or Ko-fi page. If you don't have the means, then just like, comment, and subscribe to see more of my videos. But that's all the time I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching as always, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.